Good evening and welcome to our campaign opener. Thanks to all of you for being here with us tonight. Your commitment to Federation is not only vital, but truly appreciated. Thanks to the Board of Congregation, Akhtar Shalom, and as President, Hod Heffer, and Rabbi Javier Katapan for allowing us to hold our event here. And thanks to our Executive Director, Jackie Schreier, for all she has done to make this evening happen. The Fort Wayne Jewish Federation was created more than 90 years ago to provide services for Jews in our community and assist Jews all over the world. Our donations to the annual campaign make all the services and programs we provide possible. Programs like our annual Yom HaShoah service, People of the Book Lecture, our summer day camp, scholarships to Jewish camps, assistance to those in need, and public awareness programs, like the one we hosted just last week to raise awareness in the community of the issues underlying peace in the Middle East. And by the way, when we were faced with a challenge right here in Fort Wayne with threats to the legitimacy of Israel, it was because we are a part of Jewish Federations of North America that we had some place to turn for help. And JFNA did help through its agency, Israel Action Network, which provided our outstanding speaker, Noam Gilbert. I know many of you were at that program and heard his very important and effective message. In August, Irv and I were in Ukraine, the fourth largest Jewish community in the world, but one that had been dormant for decades. We took Jewish tours of Odessa and Kiev including newly reopened synagogues in both cities. It was very exciting to see Jewish life being reborn in those communities, as it is in other countries of the former Soviet Union, after the devastation of the Holocaust and 70 years of Soviet rule. Jewish life is coming back, in part through the assistance of the Joint Distribution Committee, another one of the agencies of Jewish Federations of North America. That's just one very, very tiny piece of the overseas work done by JFNA. Our annual campaign is the lifeblood of the Fort Wayne Jewish Federation, and I am very excited that Larry and Carol Edelman are chairing this year's campaign. Both Larry and Carol have long been active in every aspect of Federation work, including previous stints as campaign chairs. Carol is out of town on a long-standing commitment but it is my pleasure to introduce Larry Edelman, who will introduce this evening's speaker. Thank you, Fran. Um, I just had dinner with our speaker, and I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to hearing her talk this evening. Our speaker this evening is Jeannie wow. Smith, who is the daughter of Polish rescuer Irene Updike, who passed away on May 18, 2003. A brave and inspiring figure, Irene received international recognition for her life-saving actions during the Holocaust. When working for a high-ranking German official, Irene's story was recently told each night on Broadway in the nationally acclaimed play, Irene's Vow, starring Tova Felscher. Irene's book, in My Hands, Memories of a Holocaust Rescuer, published by Random House, relays the detailed account of her life during the years of World War II and is used in classrooms around the country. And we'll have uh, plenty of copies, I hope, back there of the book that Jeannie has signed for us available um, after the talk this evening. The Israeli Holocaust Commission named Irene one of the righteous among the nations a title given to those who risked their lives by aiding and saving Jews during the Holocaust. She was presented with the Israel Medal of Honor, Israel's highest tribute, in a ceremony at Jerusalem's Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial. The Vatican has given Irene a special commendation, and her story is part of the permanent exhibit in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. In 2008, Irene was presented posthumously with the Commander's Cross, the Polish Medal of Honor, given by the President and First Lady of Poland, and in 2009 with the Courage to Care Award 
by the Anti-Defamation League in a special ceremony in Washington. Both of the awards were accepted by Jeannie Smith, who is here with us this evening and is Irene's only child. Jeannie resides in Woodland, Washington with her husband, Gary. She is the mother of two sons and the grandmother of three beautiful grandchildren. She is part of a new generation of Holocaust speakers called Second Generation who tell their parents firsthand experiences. I'm pleased to welcome here tonight Jeannie Smith and we look forward to hearing you speak. because I can't stand still, so. Um, I already absolutely love you. I, I fell in love with Jackie just through email. She's so <coughs> warm and friendly, and I have spoken to a lot of federations through the country, and you guys are way on the top of the list as far as being hospitable and warm, and uh, love you already. And it's always an honor to share my mom's story. If my mom were here tonight, you'd see a lady who's about barely five foot tall, with white fluffy hair and big blue eyes. And she would say in her Zsa Zsa Gabor voice, I am here tonight because I love you. And she'd mean it with her whole heart. And honestly, it is my prayer every time I get up and share her story that that love could somehow be funneled through me to you. Because we all need a whole lot of love. I was at a um, luncheon once when my mother was the keynote speaker, and when it was time for her to be introduced, the, the lady went up on a stage and stood behind the podium and introduced her, and my mom, all five foot of her, marched up there from the audience. All you could see was like white fluffy hair in her hand reaching for the microphone. And she grabbed it and walked around front, and she said, I live with a family of giants. <laughs> my husband and my daughter, they're so tall that I am a little shrimp. Mm -hmm. And it was true, she was tiny. But in the 10 years that I've been sharing her story, I have come to realize that height has absolutely nothing to do with being a giant. And I have met some amazing giants throughout this 10 year journey of sharing her story. My mother was born in Poland, very close to the German border. She was the oldest of five beautiful sisters, she used to say. Her father was an architect, her mom was a homemaker, and my mom said that their, their house sat right along the main thoroughfare, and it was known in the area that if you were traveling, regardless if you were German, Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, gypsies, and you were hungry, you could stop at the Gut house, that was my mom's maiden name, Gut, and have a meal. There was always food available for lunch, dinner. If you were traveling and it was getting late, they'd find a bed for you. That's just how she grew up. When my mom graduated high school, which she wanted to be more than anything in the whole world was a nurse, so her parents sent her to nursing school on the other end of Poland, very close to the Russian border. She had just gone to school a few days when one day she left the school building and she said it was a beautiful sunny morning, except for the sun was gone, because overhead there was airplanes flying everywhere, dropping bombs. Without any warning, Hitler had invaded Poland. All communication was cut off. My mom couldn't find out if her family was okay, if her parents and sisters were all right, if their home was still there, and they couldn't find out about her. It was just a short time after that that Stalin too invaded Poland, and her whole country was completely overtaken. My mom said it wasn't much longer after that that a group of people called the Polish underground, the partisans, they came by looking for people to join up with them to fight against the enemies in their country. And some of the teachers joined up, and my mother, who was just 18, she joined up too. They had to go out into the woods and dig holes in the forest floor, cover themselves with tarps. They had some ammunition, some radios, but it starts getting pretty cold in Poland in the fall. And it didn't take long for them to realize that they needed some more warmer clothes and some food. So a small group of them decided to go to a nearby village to get some supplies. My mom was part of this group. They walked through the forest, and when they got to the edge of town, the older ones in the group said, Irene, 
you stay back and mark the trailhead. We'll go and get what we need and come back. So she stood there all by herself. She said at the edge of town there was a bakery in the middle of baking of some hot, fresh cinnamon rolls. You know how good that smells. And you're starving. The smell was overwhelming. And my mom said she just stood there taking in this aroma and she was concentrating so much on it that she didn't see or hear a truck full of Soviet soldiers coming her way until it was too late. <coughs> Several soldiers jumped out of that truck and they chased her. She ran as fast as she could, they caught her. They beat her, ripped her clothes off, gang raped her, and left her for dead in the snow. Sometime later, another truck full of Soviet soldiers came by and they saw her little body lying there. They stopped, picked her up, threw her in the back of the truck, and dropped her off at a Soviet hospital. She was there in that hospital for a long time because her injuries were very severe, but eventually she got better. But unlike hospitals here that you get to go home when you're better, because of her involvement with the Partisan, she was not free to leave. She was a prisoner there. She worked there at that hospital for a while, but at one point, she saw a way of escape. At the end of the hallway upstairs, there was a window that was open, and she jumped out, fit through a little crack in the fence, ran as fast as she could. She wasn't sure exactly where she was, but she thought maybe a town or two away, she had an aunt that lived there, and so this time, very carefully, she made her way to her aunt's house. One evening, she said, she came to a part of town that was just strange. <laughs> the whole area was chain-linked off. The streets were empty. Doors to buildings and houses were open, windows were broken, but not a person in sight. She was tired and she found a, a building, went upstairs and fell asleep on the second story floor. And in the morning she said she woke up to sounds of shouts and screams. She went to the window and looked down in the street and she saw something that no one was really meant to see. She said what she saw was a mass of people being herded up the street like they were cattle. They were being herded up the street by German soldiers waving guns and shouting at them. And she said the people were Jews. She could tell because they had the bands on their arm with the Star of David that the Jews were first forced to wear. She said looking at this group, it would be like if the police came into your neighborhood and took every single person out. There was a cross section of people from very elderly all the way down to the newborn families of all sizes and ages. My mom looked at one young mother who was holding a tiny child as she walked and a soldier was yelling at her to do something and then with one movement of his hand, the soldier grabbed that baby, threw it up in the air and shot it. The people were forced to walk down the street and my mom snuck downstairs and followed. At the edge of town there was a big field and in the field, someone had dug a hole. My mom found a fence and hid behind it to watch. She said the Jews were forced to stand around the edge of the hole, and the parents covered their children's eyes with their hands as they were shot. And she said it was the lucky ones that were killed with the bullet, because the ground moved for hours with those that were buried alive. Now my mom was raised Catholic. She had a a very simple childlike faith, but she said, standing there that day, watching this horrific scene, she said, I raised my eyes to the heavens and I screamed out, my God, what's going on? Why don't you do something? I don't, I don't understand. She said she was so upset that she just screamed out, I don't even believe you were there. But as she continued on, she said with each step she took, there was one realization that settled into her heart, and into her soul, and it was this fact, that God gives us free will to be good or bad, to help and heal or to hurt and harm, and it's up to us. We have that choice every day. Oftentimes we have no control over what happens to us in our situations, but we always have a choice and she said it was right then and there that she made a vow that if there was ever an opportunity for her to help, she would. 
Well, she continued on and finally found the right town where her aunt lived, the right street, the right house, and just as she was coming up to the house, the front door opened up and out came her four sisters. Her whole family had gone there looking for her, and she had a wonderful reunion with them. But it was very short-lived. Because the German army, they came and they took her father away. He was an architect. They wanted him to, to continue making factories and buildings for the German war front. And in war, you had no choice. You did what you were told or you were killed. And so my grandfather and grandmother and the three younger of the girls went to be with him. But they didn't want to take my mom or the next oldest sister, Janina, because where they were going was next to a facility that they trained German soldiers and they didn't want the two teenage girls being close to that. A couple weeks later, my mom and her sister and the aunt, they went to a Sunday morning service. And when they left the church building, they found out that they were surrounded by German soldiers who pushed and shoved and segregated people. If you were very old, you were put aside, and very, very young, you were put aside. But everybody who was capable of work, which would certainly be every single person in this room, you were put on trucks. My mom was put on a truck with people she didn't know, separated from her aunt and her sister, and she was taken to the town of Tarnopol where she was forced to work at a munitions factory, making ammunition for the German war front. The conditions in the factory were bad. It was freezing, and she was starving. And one day, a high-ranking German official came to that factory to make sure that production was kept up. And when he toured the facility and he walked in front of my mom's section, she ended up fainting right, right at his feet. When she woke up, she was in the office with this major, and she was so afraid that if he thought she couldn't do the work, she could be sent further away or even killed, and so she pleaded with him, please, sir, I, I haven't been well, but I, I can learn, and I can do the work, and I am strong. Please give me another chance. This man, who was in his late 50s, looked at this teenager who was blonde and blue-eyed, very Aryan, last name Gut. She spoke perfect German, and he asked her, are you a German girl? And she answered truthfully, no, I'm Polish. He said, I like that you're honest, but it's apparent you can't do the work here. I'll take you with me today, give you another job. Well, she went with him. He was in charge of a, a large camp, not a concentration camp, but a camp that housed German officers and secretaries and soldiers, and my mom's job would be serving meals in the diner breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And she was also given one other job, to oversee the laundry room. And it was when she went in the laundry room that she was introduced to 12 Jewish people. One had been a doctor, one was a lawyer, one had been a teacher, an accountant, a nurse, married couples. They were all people of means, people who had beautiful homes, beautiful things, collections, memories, Everything they had had been taken from them, given to someone else. And now they were forced to, to work, taking care of the clothes of their captors and live in the ghetto next door. These people were starving, but my mom, she could easily sneak food from the diner, enough to feed them, enough for them to distribute amongst the ghetto. But more important than food, my mom realized that when she was serving meals, especially when the Nazis, the SS, the Gestapo were there, she could overhear plans when they were going to raid other areas. Raids where those soldiers would go in and they would break into a house, go through a neighborhood searching every cabinet, every basement, every cellar for a Jew. She could get that information to her friends and they could spread that through the ghetto and hundreds of people were able to leave areas before their area was, was raided. But one night my mom said she was serving and the major had at his table one of the heads of the Nazi party. And as she got to the table, she heard this Nazi tell the major, next week you're gonna have to have substitute workers for all to replace all of your Jews. The major argued, he said, what are you talking about? I've got quotas that have to be done. How am I gonna be able to do that without my workforce? This Nazi says, not my problem, you hire holes. Gypsies, I have my orders that by this time next week, this whole area will be too free. My mom knew that she needed to tell
tell her friends, but she struggled with telling them what was anybody going to do about it. But finally, she did. She told them what she'd heard and pleaded with her, Irene, help us. I must do something. She said, I've got a small room above the diner with a single bed and a, a table with a washstand. I, I've got no place to put you. I can't hide you in my pockets. She said that night up in her room by herself, she got down on her knees and she prayed for a miracle. And in the morning she had a miracle. Because the major came to her and he said, I've been given a new assignment. I'm taking a villa at the end of town. I'm going to be doing a lot of entertaining and you're going to be my housekeeper. She went that day to the villa with him. They rode in his wagon and when they got there, big, beautiful house on the corner of a, of a nice neighborhood. When she walked up to the door, my mom noticed a mezuzah there, the side of the doorpost. And she thought, if there was a wealthy Jewish family who lived in this house, who built this house, maybe there's a hiding place somewhere in it. So she asked the major for a pass in order to go from the camp to the villa in order to get things ready. And over the next couple of days, was able to smuggle her friends out of that camp <coughs> down the streets of the town to the villa, down the coal chute, and into the basement of the German major's house. Finally, they were all there, and she breathed a sigh of relief until the major came and said, the house is a pig pen. I want it cleaned and painted from top to bottom. My mom arrived the next day with a squad of German soldiers ready to do the cleaning and painting. She started the soldiers upstairs and kept her friends quiet in the basement. When they were finished, she brought her friends from the front staircase down to the friends from the back staircase and had them upstairs. 48 hours, these people stayed up in a little tiny area with no food, no water, no bathroom. But finally, the soldiers were done cleaning and painting. They left, she was able to get her friends back down in the basement and breathe a sigh of relief. Until the major came and said, Irene, the house looks much better. We're going to be starting our party soon. They'll be big. It'll be a lot of work, but don't worry. I'm going to bring a young soldier who can help you with everything. He can sleep in the basement. That would not work. So she went to the major and she pleaded with him, please, sir, don't bring a young soldier in here. I'd be, I'd be terrified. I'd be mortified to have a young man here. She had to tell him what had happened to her with the, the Soviet soldiers. He said, don't be an idiot. Nothing's going to happen to you in my house. You're perfectly safe here. Even so, I, I wouldn't be able to concentrate. And besides, I can do the work all myself. He said, I mean, we're going to have parties for 30, 40, 50 people a night. They'll be shopping, cooking, gardening, heavy lifting, repair work, polishing. There's just no way one person can do it all. She pleaded, and she begged, and finally he said, enough. I'll give you one chance. And one chance only. The first time you embarrass me, the first time you can't keep up, and soldier comes in. They had a really slick arrangement because when the, the major would leave the bill in the morning to go to his office, my mom would take her key and she'd put it on the inside of the door. And that way if he came home before he was supposed to, well his key wouldn't work and he'd have to ring the doorbell. My mom had one of her friends down in the basement ring up an alarm bell, and if there was a problem, she could buzz it, and they could hear it down in the basement. And they all got to looking for that hiding place, searched everywhere. Finally, down in the basement, if you removed a false panel of wood and got down on your belly, you saw a tunnel that wrapped around the side of the villa and ended in a small room that sat just underneath the gazebo, a room just big enough for 12 people. So, every day the major would get up, he'd have his breakfast, get his hat, his coat, his briefcase, and head out the door. My mom would take that key and she'd put it inside the door lock. Then she'd walk to the basement door and open it up and all 12 of her friends would come up. The men did the heavy lifting and repair work, the women did the cooking, the cleaning, the chopping, the polishing. Every day the major would come home amazed that his young teenager could do so much. Everything was prepared, and finished, clean, and ready. The nights were filled with parties, the Gestapo dining on the food that the Jews in the basement had made earlier that day. That's how they lived for a year and a half, until two of the twelve that were in the basement, a married couple, <coughs> their laser collar, 
They'd been childless their whole married life and now found out that they were expecting a baby. A baby that would be born in that basement and cry and give them all away. His parents had prayed for the child and now they were willing to give it up for the sake of everyone. So they presented my mom a list of supplies needed for an abortion. I mentioned my mother was Catholic, <coughs> but even more than her faith, she said she pleaded with them, Ida, Laser, please don't do this. I believe that this baby's a sign that we'll be all right, that we'll make it through this. I've already seen so many innocent people murdered. Hitler's not going to have this baby. It took a lot of talking, but finally, all of them agreed that they would just wait and see what would happen. They were in it together. Life went on, parties at night, working during the daytime. Until one day, my mom had to go into town to get some more supplies for an upcoming party. And when she was in the store, she said a German soldier came in and screamed at everyone, get outside. She didn't know what was going on, but she walked outside and noticed that both sides of the sidewalk were filled with people. The whole town had been evacuated. In the middle of the street was a set of gallows that had been built. It was a Polish family with two small children. They had been caught hiding a Jewish family with a small child in their house. Mom said there were signs on every street corner saying death would happen if you befriended a Jew. All throughout Poland, it was big trouble to help a Jew, but in Poland, if you helped a Jew, if you gave him a piece of bread, it was death for you, your husband and wife, your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters. She said that day everybody in town was forced to stay and watch what would happen if you befriended a Jew. They hung the children first in front of the parents. And she said, I stood there with my eyes closed, but even with closed eyes, you can see, because you can feel, you can hear. And that day, walking back to the villa, she said, I was like a zombie. All I could think of was, I can't tell my friends what I've seen. There's nothing they could do about it. But because she was so shook up, when she got back to the villa, she forgot to do what she had done every day before that. She forgot to leave her key on the inside of the door lock. She walked into the kitchen and put her groceries down, went to the basement door, opened it up, and let three of the women come up to help her with the evening meal. She said, we were standing there talking, and all of a sudden there was a noise at the kitchen door. She turned and looked, and there was the Major standing there, his eyes bulging, his chin shaking. She had the ladies run back downstairs, and he turned around and went to his office where his telephone was. She said, I had no choice. I ran after him and I grabbed a hold of his legs. He turned around and screamed at her, how could you dare do this in my own home? Under my own nose after all I've done for you. Why? Well, she was crying and said, they're my friends. No one has the right to kill because of race or religion. These people, they've done nothing wrong. Punish me. Kill me. I'll let them go, they're, they're innocent. He said, Irene, you <laughs> kill us all. I, I don't even know what to think. I, I have to have time to think this through. I'm gonna go to my office and what I do, don't you go anywhere, don't you talk to anyone. When he left, she ran in the kitchen, she got some food and water, and went downstairs, gave it to her friends, to get in the hiding place. If I don't come back in three days, that means I'm dead. And she went back upstairs to wait. Finally, he came back, he had gone to the tavern and had gone drinking, came in the villa, went into his office, and she didn't have any choice. She went in there to find out his decision of life or death. And when she stood before him, he reached his arm out, pulled her down on his lap, and he said, I've made a decision. I'm gonna keep your secret before a price. You have to be mine anytime I ask, and willingly. My mom, her uh, experience with men so far had been a gang rape and now a 60-year-old man. But she said there was no choice to be made. There was too many lives at stake. My mother never told her friends in the basement what had to be done. She said their integrity would have never let her make that decision. But they did all survive. 
And eventually the Soviets came in and started pushing the Germans out of Poland. The front was collapsing, things were in an uproar. And the major at one point came to my mom and said, Irene, I, I've got orders to move my unit. Are you coming with me? She said, I want to find my family, my parents, my sisters. It had been now over five years since she'd seen or heard from them. And so as he started getting ready to, to move out, my mom contacted her friends in the resistance who were still out there in the woods and said, make room, I'm bringing you 12 people and one very pregnant woman. She took the major's wagon, took her friends two by two, laid them in the bottom of the wagon, took the horses, covered her friends with blankets, shovels, food, things you'd need to live out in the woods, and rode them out to the edge of the woods until all 12 of them were there. She stayed with them, and six days later, a little baby boy was born out there in the woods in freedom. Eden Laser named their baby Roman, Roman Holler. And my mom said holding baby Roman was her payment in full for everything she'd gone through. Now her friends wanted her to continue staying there because it's a very dangerous place when the front collapses. But she did want to find her family, so she left them. A lot of things happened during that time, but eventually my mother was captured, this time by the Soviets. After all, she'd been the mistress of a high-ranking German official, and the Soviets accused her of being a spy. She was put in a concentration camp and told she'd be sent to Siberia for the rest of her life. And she thought her life was over. No way to contact her family if they were still alive to let them know what had happened to her. She was in that camp for four or five months. Now the, now the Soviets hired men on a daily basis to deliver food to the prisoners, and oftentimes they hired Jew, uh, Jewish men. One night, one of the Jewish men that they hired happened to be one of the Jewish men my mom hid in the basement of the major's house. And when he came to the camp that night, he, he just happened to see her out there. He called out, Irene, what are you doing here? She was so overwhelmed just seeing a face that she knew that she said, I couldn't even speak. I just stood there and cried. He came back later that night with friends, and they smuggled her out of that camp. They dyed her blonde hair black. They got false identity papers for her. She wasn't going to beat Irina a good Polish Catholic. Now she was Sonia Sofersky, a Jewish refugee. They smuggled her out of Poland took her to Germany and put her in a DP camp, displaced persons camp, where she was for quite some time trying to put her life together. While she was there, she found out her father had been shot and killed for refusing to move off the sidewalk. She had heard her mother had a stroke and she didn't think she made it through, but she couldn't find out anything about her four younger sisters at all, and she assumed that they didn't make it. While she was at the camp, there was a group of men who came to do interviews. The war was ending, and they wanted interviews of the people who had gone through things. And there was an American delegate who came to the camp my mom was at. He could speak English and French. He interviewed my mother who could speak Polish, German, Russian, and Yiddish. And through an interpreter, she told him her story. And afterwards, he said, the United States would be very honored to have you. She didn't want to come to the United States. She wanted to stay there. She wanted to find her family, but she was afraid because she was wanted by the Soviets and the Germans that if she did find her sisters, if they were still alive, she could bring great trouble on them. So in 1949, she came on a cargo ship to the United States all by herself with no money, no English skills, no one waiting for her here. When she came into Ellis Island and saw the Statue of Liberty, that was my favorite part of when she used to tell the story, coming into the United States, seeing that statue. She said, I'm in a free country, a fresh start, a new beginning. And she said, right then and there, I put a do not disturb sign over all of my memories. I will never talk about, think about what, what has happened. Now, my mom couldn't speak a word of English, but she was in New York and she could speak Yiddish. <laughs> she made a lot of wonderful Jewish friends who helped her get a job in the garment district, helped her get a little apartment. My mom worked very hard for five years, but she became a United States citizen, and nobody loved this country as much as she did. 
to celebrate. She went to a very nice restaurant in Manhattan, super crowded for lunch. In fact, there was only one empty chair right next to hers. While she was eating, a man came and said, may I sit here? And he looked at her. He said, I know you. Turns out he was the UN delegate who interviewed her in the DP camp in Germany. The very man who'd invited her to the United States. He asked the pretty young blonde out to dinner that night. And the next night, and six weeks later, they were married. <laughs> my parents moved from the East Coast out to Southern California, where I was born. And my mother became an interior decorator <laughs> with that little Jean Jacques Gabor voice <laughs> and her ability to sketch. She was very, very well known. She could come into your house and say, Oh, darling, we can do this, and we can do that, and it will be beautiful. <laughs> and that's how I knew my mom. Elegant, talented, very beautiful, but I have never heard any of these stories that I just told you. True to her word, she kept that do not disturb sign up. It wasn't until I was 14, the three of us were having dinner one night, and the phone rang, and my mom got up to answer it, and on the other end of the phone was a college student doing a survey for a report at school, and his topic, the Holocaust never happened. It's just propaganda, drummed up by the Jews to create sympathy for themselves, and he was calling random people to find out what they thought. He found out. <laughs> and I did too that night. He, she started telling this amazing story, and I remember looking at my dad saying, what is she talking about? He was the only one in this country who knew her story. He said she's talking about her life. And you know, when my mom hung up the phone, the phone that night, tears streaming down her face, she looked at us and she said, all these years I've kept silent about what hate can do. I've allowed evil, I've allowed the enemy to win. Because if we don't talk about it, if we don't tell other people, if they don't learn from this history, will continue to repeat itself. And so she said, I'm willing from now on to tell anybody who's willing to listen. My dad was the uh, president of our local Rotary Club there in Orange County. And that Friday, the speaker who was supposed to talk called and canceled last minute and they needed someone. And so my mom went and told her story. It was a newspaper reporter who wrote up an article. A rabbi in the next town read it and got the ball rolling for her to, to continue speaking. And before she passed away at age 85, she'd been to every state and, and every school. That was her thing. I'll come and speak to any organization you want, but get me into the schools. Because kids were her passion. They're the ones that need to learn. And, and she would tell the kids, you're the future generation, and it's up to you to make different choices. When my mom spoke, after hugging each one of you, she would say, one person can make a difference. <coughs> the power of one is so amazing. Don't discount it. Don't sit there and say, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm too rich, I'm too poor, I'm too busy. Every day, we have an opportunity to make a difference, an impact, to stand up against something hateful, to stand for something that's right. As my mom's daughter, what I've learned through all this is that when you give out of love, out of the attitude of complete love for another human being, realizing that we're all part of one human family, you get back so very, very much. In 1982, my mom received a phone call from a young man named Roman Holler. He was the baby that was born out there in the woods. His son was being bar mitzvahed, and he wanted his mother to be there. His own parents had been long gone. It was such an honor for her to be a part of that. But when she met up with Roman, she found out something amazing. And that's what happened to the Major she'd lived with as his housekeeper. When the war was over, Major Rudner, that was his name, he finally went back to Germany to his wife. She had heard that he'd had a, a long affair with his young Polish housekeeper, and she didn't want anything to do with him. She refused to let him back in the house. So he went to his friends in the town, people he'd known his whole life. But there was rumors circulating 
And Major Ruger might have become a Jew sympathizer. And there was so much fear associated with that that no one would let this man, now in his mid-60s, maybe even later, no one would let him into their home. <coughs> he had nowhere to go, and he was literally forced to live on the street as a homeless man. Roman's parents, Ida and Laser, heard about the Major's fate, and they put baby Roman in the car, and they drove to that town in Germany, drove through the streets, and they searched every homeless face until they found him. Then they put him in the back seat and took him home. And Roman grew up calling him grandfather to the day he died. You know what that is? That's an amazing example of forgiveness. And I want to tell you that if you can put the kind of love it takes to care about another human being, and you can couple that with that kind of forgiveness, you have a power greater than any army, more powerful than any weapon. Because love and forgiveness like that, it opens the most closed minds, and it softens the hardest of hearts. In 1984, my mom was speaking to a, a large group in Los Angeles, and afterwards a couple right in the front row came up and said, Irene, we're going to Poland. We'd love to try and help you find your sisters. It had been over 40 years since she'd heard from them, and she was sure they were gone. She said, if there was one or two alive, they would be married women now, with different last names. But she gave what she knew, Janina, Maria, Bronia, Wajigut. She never thought any more of it. Well, this couple went to Poland, and they diligently checked the consul at the embassy, the local Catholic churches, and came up with nothing. On the last day, in a taxi cab on the way to the airport, they thought, it is a long plane ride home. Let, let's stop and get some snacks for the plane ride. And so they asked the taxi cab driver, could you, could you pull over in the corner store? <coughs> they did. They got out. They got their items. They went to the shopkeeper, and they thought, let's try one more time. They pulled out that list and read it to them. Do you know these women? Janina, Maria, Bronia, Wajagut? So I never heard of them. But there was a woman who had been shopping in the back of the store. She came running up, grabbed the list out of their hands, pointed at one of the names and said, this one is me. These others are my sisters. This young couple was able to give my Aunt Bronia my mom's address. And a week later, she got what she said was her letter from heaven. Letter from all four of her sisters. We found you. We love you. Come and see us. So we were able to get my mom a plane ticket to go back to Poland. I remember driving her to LAX. She was so excited. She kept telling me everything she could remember about her sisters, how tall they were, and what their hair looked like, and how they could sing, on and on and on. She could have flown to Poland herself. She was so excited. She got on the plane and flew into Warsaw, and then got on a small little commuter plane to go into the town where her sisters would be waiting for her, and they talked to her the next day. <laughs> she was so cute. She said, I was looking at the plane for my four beautiful sisters, and there's four gray hair babushkas. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize they were getting old too. She said. What an amazing blessing to step off that plane to see family that you thought were gone, to go into their homes, to meet their husbands, their children, to see your parents' grave sites. Truth is, how we give out of attitude of love, out of a spirit of forgiveness, get ready, because you get back so very, very much. You know, it's true even in our lives, and my mom started speaking for mostly the Federation. She stopped doing her interior design work. She loved sharing her story. She loved meeting all the amazing people, and I can understand why. It didn't pay a whole lot, but that was okay. My dad uh, had long since retired. They weren't very good at saving money. And Coming back from a trip once, a speaking trip, my mom realized my dad, he was getting more and more senile, actually had come down with Alzheimer's. A neighbor had found him wandering the streets and had brought him back. 
He couldn't remember whether he took his medicine, and my mom realized she couldn't go and speak anymore. She couldn't leave him alone. She didn't have money to put him in a home. She didn't have money to hire someone. I was already living in Washington State. And the next time my mom was called by the New York Federation to do a talk, she cried and said, I can't go. I can't leave my husband. He's too ill. And she thought that was the end of it. The New York Federation contacted the Los Angeles Federation, who contacted the Jewish Home for the Aged in Lasita, California. It was a beautiful facility for seniors and specialized in Alzheimer's, but they only took Jewish people. It was very, very expensive, and there was a long waiting list to get in. The next day, my mom received a phone call from the president of the Jewish Home for the Aged in Lasita, California. He said, you bring your husband in this afternoon. The Jewish Federation has paid for his care for the rest of his life. After my dad passed away several years later, the Jewish Federation continued to support my mother, even though she couldn't speak anymore. <coughs> they made her an honorary lion. I get to wear this now very proudly. The truth is, when you give, out of a heart of love, because we all, all are part of one human family. And you get back so much. Thank you so much, and God bless you.